Thank you for having me here. Um, so uh, let me just say a word about the, the social physics. So social physics is a is a, a phrase that's almost two centuries old. Um, it came up at the same time that uh, natural science transitioned to physics and alchemy transitioned to chemistry. And there was this idea of being able to do some sort of mathematical statistical description uh, of society and the evolution of culture. Um, and actually, that's where national statistical offices came from. Uh, so I remember being in London and seeing Queen Victoria's charter to the Royal Statistical Society, which essentially is a, a charter for something like social physics, to, for, for the government to be able to use data and statistics to understand society. Um, and the phrase fell out of use because um, it was a little too overblown uh, for the capabilities. They really didn't have much data. You had to you know, do it by going around by surveys. And the statistics, I mean, the field of statistics really was just getting started then. So um, it, was, it was quite visionary in its day. Um, and what I want to talk about today is uh, reinventing the social contract. And, and this is uh, an attempt to be visionary, <laughs> OK, <laughs> as opposed to uh, something that's a concrete proposal just to sort of make you aware that I think that there's something interesting afoot that, that we want to take a, a advantage of. I want to also say a little bit about who I am um, so that you know what questions. You can ask me nasty questions. Um, so I helped set up the Media Lab uh, at MIT, and now I'm setting up a new thing called the Institute for Data Systems and Society. Uh, I work with Manu back there uh, to put together the Data Pop Alliance, which is Harvard, myself, uh, and the Overseas Development Institute here, and Flowminder now, um, to think about ways of introducing countries to uh, what they could do with data and having that sort of discussion in many different countries. Um, I also uh, sit on the advisory boards of uh, a couple of interesting things. So AT&T, I chair their board, big data board, to help them think through problems of uh, ethics, liability, so forth, with big data. Um, and I just joined uh, the advisory board for Tencent, who is concerned about it. And I will just point out that the contrast between Tencent's and China's view of these issues and the views expressed here is large. <laughs> so it's an interesting experience. I also just joined the American Bar Association Advisory Board for the same thing. How does law evolve in this world? Because law will be very different. And that has to do with reinventing the social contract. So let me just sort of dive in. Um, so we live in a world that, where we leave all sorts of data around. That data is actually necessary for things like cell phones, credit cards, and so forth. And this is not a trivial thing. Um, for the very first time, most adults, 80, 90 percent of all adults uh, in the entire world, all of humanity, have a two-way connection. Um, they have the ability to lodge complaints, get information. It's not necessarily realized completely, uh, but that was unbelievable as little as 15 years ago. Fifteen years ago, you probably don't remember it, the common phrase at places like the World Economic Forum or the UN was, half of humanity has never made a phone call. And now, what, 80, 90 percent have a phone. That's just an incredible transformation. Um, many things have happened as a consequence of that. It's arguable that infant mortality has dived because of the ability to get information uh, in places that never was before. Um, certainly, there's a strong argument that uh, incomes have changed around the world because of this. At any rate, we're not about to give it up. We have to live with it somehow. Um, and while it has many problems, and you've heard a lot about that, it also has some very good things. One of the good things is, is that it allows us to understand ourselves better. 
So um, these are just sort of two quotes from things that I wrote in Nature. Uh, well, the first one was written about me in Nature, and the next one was a, a joint statement in uh, Science. What we were getting at was, if you look at social science, and this is the broad range of social science, the amount of data that goes into our understanding of phenomena is often pathetic. The very biggest studies, often in medicine, are things like the, you may not be familiar with the Framingham Heart Study. It's why we know about cholesterol and heart disease. and th So 30,000 people, 30 years. But they collected something like one number per person per month. And that's the biggest ever. Okay? So these guys could have been out there like dancing the whole time or drinking themselves silly. We don't really know because they only collected one number per month. No context. So suddenly we have the ability to have very rich context, complete data from entire communities or very nearly entire communities in a way we've never had before. And it allows us to understand ourselves better. Now, to say why this is important, let's just think about this. Led by an invisible, everybody knows this quote or something like it, right? Um, who knows where it's from? Yes. Sit, speak. You raised your hands. It's what everybody says and it's wrong. It's not in Wealth and Nations. Theory of moral sentiments, yes. In fact, that model sort of codified that way didn't really become popular until the late 1800s when the, the economists and statisticians realized they couldn't hold the mathematics of what uh, Adam Smith was really saying, and I'll come to that in a minute, and they decided that they had to decide that people were independent, which means they don't talk to each other, and rational, which means they can calculate all of the you know, uh, complexities of the future uh, in making decisions. Um, and this model actually is enormously influential. So this is cooked up in the you know, late, uh, early 1700s um, at a time when truth was supposed to be coming from the church or the king, right? And somebody said, no, it's you. You can make up your mind and that's where the truth comes from. And, and the bourgeoisie of the time felt flattered. The aristocrats felt flattered. And they sort of took up this idea and said, yeah, we can make up our own minds. And, as a, and, a, and I think this is really a plausible story about the history. That idea may well have been the key in bringing down the power of the church and the king and installing democracy. It's the fact that people felt flattered that they could make decisions. But think about what this model is. This model says, first of all, we don't talk to each other. We're all independent. Our ideas are our own. We're rational. We're not emotional. We know that's sort of wrong, right? Um, and we're greedy. We're always trying to satisfy ourselves. So it's like, you know, we're cave people out there trying to club things or something. That's the model that democracy is built on, right? You take two you know, opposing views, you know, the people are supposed to rationally consider them and so forth, and out of that, truth will emerge. Uh, in the American legal system, uh, when you have a court case, you don't argue about the truth of it. You get these two opposing views, and they're trying to prevail by whatever means necessary. Uh, it's a sort of odd description of humans. But it was a, a reasonable first approximation, and particularly for the 1700s. But is it true? Well, you know, now we can begin to understand the extent to which this is actually true of people everywhere all the time. Well, it's not a matter of just abstract debate. We could actually begin answering it, because we have data. So here's an example of data. So we have access to about 100 million credit card records. So there's six years of credit card records for about 100 million Americans. That's about half of the population. And um, all the things I'm going to tell you about, first of all, were under US federal human subjects law. Same thing as medical research. 
So you don't need to worry about privacy in these cases. What you do need to worry about is that other people have access to this who are not under human subject stuff. Um, and I'll sort of point out the difference. Anyhow, if you look at a typical person, this is what you see. And this is almost universal. You see that they have places where they go all the time. So this is frequency of going to a place, a grocery store, gas station, restaurant around the corner. Big arrows mean you do it a lot. You go from here back to here, go from here to there. And we're extraordinarily predictable as people. So if I know what you do in the morning, I can predict what you're going to do in the evening and with who with 90 to 95% accuracy. So we like to think of ourselves as sort of, you know, choosing things, but actually we're constrained by our environment a great deal and by culture. But what all people do is occasionally they break loose and they explore the environment. They go to places that they've never gone to before and never will again. Um, and that behavior is unpredictable by anything anyone's ever been able to come up with. Okay? It's highly entropic behavior. And what's interesting about this is this is very much like you see in almost every animal species. It's called foraging behavior. So you, you, know, you watch the rabbit get up and get some berries in the morning. You know, they go to the same bush day after day, same time. And then every once in a while, that rabbit will do something weird, which is they'll go sort of explore in other places. And of course, what they're doing from an evolutionary fitness point of view is knowing about the territory so that if that bush goes away, they have some options. Okay? They're sort of like building up a map just in case. Okay? Discovering things. And that's what people do too. Um, and it's interesting because it's not obviously economic behavior. So for instance, if you take poor people, people in the bottom 20 percentile, when they explore, they also find things where they change their habits. So exploration is tightly tied to habits for them. They're optimizing their life. Mm -hmm. But if you take rich people, this is the top 20 percent, you find that they explore without changing what they do. They explore for the heck of it. They're just finding stuff to do, right? So it, it's not obviously economic behavior at all. And in fact, what's interesting is, um, well, so there's a number of things. There. One is, is that you can tell somebody's income by looking at how much uh, exploration and turnover they do. So I can watch you and see how much random stuff you do, and that tells me about your income. Okay. The other thing is, is that if you change your behavior, you change how much you explore, that's a sign that you're under stress of some sort. In fact, we took a large European city uh, where we had credit card data for all the people. And what we found was is when people changed the ratio of their exploration, it was a good signal that they were going to get in economic trouble in the next couple months. Now you can use that in a variety of ways. First of all, you shouldn't generally have access to that data. Um, but you know, you could have a benevolent bank or a credit union or something that would watch your behavior for this. And if it sees a big change, would go out and sort of give you a phone call and say, is everything OK? And maybe that would be useful. It turns out that it's not just this sort of behavior, this financial behavior. It's all sorts of stuff where humans ex exhibit this exploratory foraging behavior. So if you look at where people call, so what we did is we took an entire community and we asked them if they wanted to participate in an experiment. We gave them phones and what we did is monitored their uh, uh, behavior, right, over time. All anonymized, all under IRB, don't give me a hard time about it, <laughs> okay. But what we found is uh, when people were getting sick, so they're coming down with the flu, they'd eaten something bad, they were getting depressed. They changed their behavior. And what they did is they changed this exploratory behavior. They stopped calling the same diversity of people. They only restricted it to a small number of people. They stopped exploring the city. They constricted what they did. It was about 80% accurate. 
uh, for these people. So these are a whole community over a year. And this has turned into a commercial thing. Uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is the largest vertically integrated health system in the US, uses this for at-risk patients. So the patient says, the doctor says to an at-risk patient, you could have this thing on your phone. And what it is is a check engine light. You know, what it lets us do is know when to reach out to you. So if you're a congestive heart failure person and they see that your exploratory behavior suddenly changes, someone will give you a call. Right? And it's pretty good at identifying when something bad happens. It doesn't always happen, right? Could be, oh, I just, I'm writing the great American novel or something. But, but more often than not, quite a bit more often than not, is when something's going wrong. And that's why this quote across the top happened, which is an innovation that will save our health system. Because if you can find people before they're seriously ill, it's cheaper to fix them and you can fix them better. If you wait till they get really, really sick, then it's very expensive and very hard to fix. So this is a sort of early warning system. I like to joke, it's like the check engine light in your car, right? When that goes on, you ought to have it looked at. So these things are not rational individuals, I don't think. They're doing this sort of non-economic thing that's based on curiosity, on building social structure. It doesn't really look like that model of the early 1700s to me. And in fact, that's not what Adam Smith said in Moral Sentiments. This is the uh, sort of more complete picture of the invisible hand. It's human nature to exchange goods and ideas, and it's the exchanges, the peer-to-peer -peer things, not the market, that guide people to create solutions for the good of the community. This is exactly the opposite of market theory, right? <coughs> it's the guys talking to each other. So it's not far from being independent. It's the conversation between people that matters, not the market itself, okay? That's what he's saying. Um, that's a really different model. So to pop all the way back up, when people talk about s social contracts, what they're typically thinking about, historically, is this individual, rational decision makers that's very greedy and competing with everybody else. But there's another model, which is people trying to work out how to make things good for everybody. And that the value comes from peer-to-peer -peer things. That's a different model of humanity, and you can have a different social contract that's built on top of that. What would that look like? Well, that would be a community, a government, that uses the conversations between people as <coughs> the main thing that generates decisions, as the main thing that you would reward uh, and encourage. I'll give you some examples of what that might look like, because I don't know what it looks like. I'm just saying it's really different than what our current systems are built on, okay? And I think we have an opportunity to reassess our current systems and think about something that values person-to-person -person communication a lot more than we do today. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. This is from some friends of mine. This is data from um, Mexico. Um, and what they did is they looked at financial data and communication data. And you can map out somebody's communication network. So this is two hops, the people you talk to and then the people they talk to. And this is a little faded in terms of the contrast. Top 1% looks like that, the, the wealthiest people in society. Rich, bushy communication structures, pretty much always. Poor people look like that. Not very bushy, <laughs> okay? And you can measure this by something that they called uh, collective influence, which is basically how many people can you reach and influence within two hops? Your friends of friends. Do you have a lot of them or a few of them? And the other way around is the more interesting thing in one sense is because that's how many opportunities do you hear about, right? Oh, 
Bill says that there's this thing happening over there. You should go find, you know, right? Opportunities. Opportunities create wealth. What's really interesting is, is the correlation is incredibly strong. And we have data from a couple of other countries that show very similar sorts of things and also show some interesting things in terms of class structure, segregation, um, ethnic divides, things like that. But that's completely different than the normal theories of wealth, right? I didn't talk about education. I didn't talk about capital. I didn't talk about any of all that stuff, right? I just said, how many people are you connected to? And that tells me how wealthy you are. And lest you think that that's just those developing countries, you can do the same thing in this country. And it works really pretty well. Okay? In fact, what we did is we used, um, in this case, it's uh, public data. This is from uh, Foursquare. So we looked at uh, communication structure within 300 cities, 150 in Europe, 150 in the US. Um, and what we looked at is of something that's very much like that last figure. It's not quite calculated the same way, but it's effectively the same. So social tie engagement density, ties, GDP per square mile. That's the US, you can tell, because it's miles. And this is Europe, square kilometer. This angle there, interestingly, has mostly to do with transportation infrastructure. Europe has a different infrastructure than the US. The US is mostly these big highways. That means that in the US, there are more people within 30 minutes of you than there are in Europe. And as a consequence, you get a, a what the data suggests that as a consequence, you get a less improvement in GDP with population than you would in the US. Okay? So all those ugly highways <laughs> that we have, right? Maybe do something. Um, these are extremely strong correlations, incidentally. But they are just correlations. Everybody always asks about that. Um, you can use this in other countries. You can do it either by communication structure from telephones, or you can do it by mobility, the way the last thing was. Oh, I should mention, this is not internet communication. Internet communication does not show this effect at all. Okay? This is physical meetups. Okay? Similarly here, I was showing this. These are phone conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations. They are not Twitter. They are not any of those other things. Those don't show this sort of effect. Think about that a little bit. Here's um, one of the first things we did uh, with Orange. This is um, the same sort of measurement in Cote d'Ivoire, estimating uh, this multi, uh, multi factor poverty index. Um, and it seems to be, again, really, really good at the best sort of UN statistics for estimating poverty. So, what that's telling you is, is that ghettos are bad. If the people don't talk to each other, if they don't talk to the surrounding communities, they're bad off. They're not rich, their babies die, they don't live very long. If they're well connected with the rest of the, the country, if they're well connected within themselves, they tend to do a lot better. That's clearly not the only factor, right? As you were explaining, right? There's other sort of factors that go on in there. Um, but it's pretty strong. It comes from many different things. So for instance, this is a data that we have from uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, they were interested in, they have uh, an unemployment problem that's like Italy or Spain, um, about 30% unemployment. And uh, unlike many places, they keep track of everything. So you can go in and you can say, how long does it take someone to get a job? 
and you can look at it in terms of their education profile, their training, their previous job history. And what they found is that there's a multimodal distribution. Some people get jobs very quickly. People who are identical in terms of their normal qualifications, there's another distribution that gets it very, very, uh, very slowly. It's very hard for them to get a job. You want to guess what the difference is between those two groups? They didn't know this. They looked at this for like 10 years. What do you think? That's one aspect, but it's, it's actually different than that. That's a, that's a major reason it's this. It has to do with transportation infrastructure. Women can't drive. That means if you've got poor public transportation, they can't get jobs. They can't search for jobs, more importantly. Right? The men show the same effect. If you happen to live in one of these low transportation areas, your odds of getting a job are, are less. But obviously, the impact on the women is a lot more, because they can't drive. And I guess Nuria showed this earlier. Yes? So this is looking at O2 data in London and crime data. And the way I like to describe this is, is that when you have a city square and the mixing between different populations changes suddenly, then you know some sort of stress has happened. And often that stress is crime. So this is just like the stuff I showed you with the individuals. When their habits change, suddenly, when their exploration diminishes suddenly, something's wrong. And quite often it's disease or stress of some sort. So this is a really different theory of society, right? This is not based on skills, capital, things like that. This is based on people finding opportunities, collaborating with each other, being able to, to take advantage of things by finding it. I'm not saying this is the whole thing, right? I'm just saying that this is not the stuff. When you go to Davos and you listen to all these great and powerful people being advised by all their advisors, they don't talk about this stuff, right? They talk about market forces. They talk about capital accumulation. Well, maybe actually human communication is as or more important. And that the infrastructure to promote mixing between populations is as important as capital <coughs> accumulation. Wouldn't it be interesting to sort of think about what sort of society you'd end up with if you were there? Um, I think we're at an interesting inflection point in that regard. So hold that thought for a second. So uh, a couple of years ago now, I got asked to be part of this uh, group for the UN Secretary General that was helping to put together the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the 15-year goals for the UN. Um, and uh, the Secretary General called this the UN Data Revolution. And his idea, the idea of all those people, his, his little coterie of people, was the following, is the observation that with the Millennium Development Goals, 2000 to 2015, the ones that were successful were the ones that they could measure easily and measured regularly. And the ones that weren't successful were the ones that they couldn't measure. I thought, well, gee, <laughs> maybe if we measure things, we'll be able to do better, OK? And uh, work like I just showed you informed a rather bold statement that said, we're going to measure this stuff this time around. We got 17 goals. We're going to come up with 170 odd, 170 of one uh, things that we're going to measure that relate to inequality, to gender violence, to this, that, and the other thing. Poverty, you name it, right? Deforestation. We're going to measure this. And we're going to ask all the national statistical offices around all the countries in the world to come up with a uniform way of doing this. And the first thing everybody says is, yeah, right, sure, <laughs> that'll never happen. Uh, but then you should notice that people like the World Bank and Britain and so forth um, are beginning to say, well, we won't donate any more money unless you do measure this stuff and do it in a sort of credible way. So there's a stick behind it, OK? And there's also a carrot, which is you get bragging rights, and maybe you could actually be a better government. You never know. 
if you actually measured what was happening in your country? Wouldn't that be a change? Um, and so we're at a point where there's a charter that says, gee, maybe we should measure how well we're doing on these basic human rights and these, these basic goals, right? And governments have sort of signed on to this. They don't know what they're signing on to, right? Um, but we get to decide what that means because they don't know what that means. They look to us to decide what does this measurement of these development goals mean? How are we going to do this? And if we can come up with good answers for this, people like the World Bank and the other funders will sort of push them to do it. Now that's, to me, a revolution in transparency and accountability. And there are problems with it. <laughs> I'm not going to say there aren't, right? Uh, obviously there are problems. But I have never seen anything that looked like a worldwide commitment to transparency and accountability before. So that's sort of cool. Now, so we got this thing where our social contract that our, our societies work on is based on bad 17th century science. Maybe we have the chance of doing a better job. And we have a commitment from all these countries to start measuring stuff. Maybe we could put the two together. If you put the two together, you get something that I think is plausibly a new social contract. Right? <coughs> we're going to measure stuff, and we're going to use that. And the way we interpret those measurements is through this new understanding of people. Right, this more advanced social understanding of people. And maybe we can do a better job than we've been doing. So lots of experiments for this happening. Well, this is a cool thing we're doing in Andorra. We have maps of Andorra. You can see the people mixing things like that. And you stand around and you can look at it and have different part, different the, the, the thing that's cool here, right? is that there's a different stakeholders from the community discussing data together. Right in front of them. It's actually 3D. This one's actually, you know, you can sort of see the mountains and see the people. And, and yeah, it's got problems. All visualizations have problems. But it's amazing what happens when you get contentious people, people who hate each other, right? who have different views of the world around a display like this where they can see the data in lots of different ways and talk about it and point to things. They, they begin to take, they begin to listen to each other a little better. They begin to have a better discussion. That doesn't mean it's like completely, it's not like God came down and gave truth to these people. No, no, no. But, but it actually, stand, standing around, right? <coughs> Pointing at things, looking at things together, is an amazingly effective thing. Um, and so people are beginning to do it. They're beginning to do it here, too. I have some friends at Imperial that are looking at subway lines that are being proposed in London and asking, how will these subway lines change opportunities for people? Not, you know, the normal sort of ways you look at it, but looking at you know, will people from this community be able to talk to people from that community? Will people from a poor community be able to have um, access to other opportunities? That was a pretty nice way to talk about things. It's different than talking about capital. It's different than talking about education. Not that those other things aren't important, but it's a different way of thinking about things. So I, I found this picture recently. <laughs> you guys probably recognize it. Um, so all of this gets to the sort of obvious, you know, elephant in the room, um, which is if there's all this data floating around, um, doesn't it turn us into serfs or slaves? And I would say to you, you already are. You look at your digital identity and ask the question, who owns your digital identity? <laughs> it ain't you. Right? You don't even know what people know about you. So how can you reclaim it? Well, 
that, of course, is a key part of this endeavor, is that people have to get involved in this in a knowledgeable way. Um, so many years ago, this is back in 2008, I started a discussion at Davos um, uh, with people like the Justice Commissioner of the EU and the head of the Federal Trade Commission in, in the US and the heads of many big companies about what I call the New Deal on data, which is the idea that people should have rights of ownership in their data. It's different than actually owning the data. It's actually old English common law. It means that you ought to be able to know what's happening to data about you, and you ought to have the ability to guide it in some way and help it be disposed the way that's to your advantage. And, you know, at some small way, this was resulted uh, in the uh, European uh, Data Protection Acts that we now have. Um, and it was just a first step. So the things that we've been working on are um, trying to get a win-win-win solution for this sort of new ecology of data that we need to be able to have in order to support the new transparency and accountability and this sort of new social contract. And there's obviously the challenge with individuals. Um, most of this data is commercial data. And what that means is they have to be part of the solution too. I mean, the government can go in and say, oh, you have to give us your data. I think a tax on data is fine, right? But you have to incent them to actually do it. They have to, they have to get something out of it too. And then societal stuff. So some of the things, like I showed the poverty map in Cote d'Ivoire, that's sort of interesting, but you can also see ethnic divisions in the same map. Now you remember, they had a civil war not recently along ethnic boundaries. So having a nice map of where those bad guys live is a little controversial. So there are ethical things that are at the societal scale, for sure. Um, and the thought was is to change the paradigm find a new way of thinking about this. And um, so we have been working on that. We now have a group, which is um, my group, the Data Pop guys, which is uh, Harvard uh, Overseas Development. Orange is a, a leader in this because they've been putting a lot of energy into it. It's being funded by uh, the French version of the, uh, of the basic research thing, World Bank, Forum, Paris 21. And the idea here is, is to, instead of sharing data, to be able to share questions and answers. So instead of you giving me your data, I'll ask you a question and you'll give me an answer that's a certified answer, if you want to. <laughs> okay? And it's not a perfect solution, but it changes the equation a lot because it minimizes the data and it puts control in other places. When you share data, then you get these places where all the data is and nobody knows it's there and they can do whatever they want with it and you don't know. So this makes the transfer and use of data much more visible. Um, a way to think about it is, is that if I want to know how many people are in a city square, I'll send a, a pre-certified algorithm to my local telco the telco will evaluate that on their data in this little sandbox in a certified way. You know, certified in the sense that the software is certified. Obviously, there are things they could do that would, you know, take some technical effort, but they could screw it up. And then the answer comes back. You know, there are 47 people there right now. Something like that. Okay, so that's the sort of mental model. It's trying to do things like make maps of things that people have looked at and said, yeah, that's safe. So the, the sort of genius of this open algorithms is now the questions that you can ask have been looked at by the public. They've been looked at by technical experts. Otherwise, they're not on the list of certified things that you can ask, okay? And the data doesn't move. These are questions that get answered. Okay, so what it's doing is, is it's building in a public discussion about what sort of data analyses can happen. 
And part of it is, it says blockchain up there. Does everybody know blockchain? No. Um, blockchain is this, got popularized as a name. It's a thing under Bitcoin. It's a distributed ledger. There's lots of these, not just the Bitcoin one, okay? Lots of ways of doing it. The cool thing is you can have a group of people, three of which are criminals who are trying to screw you, and it still works. You need to have a majority of people who are trying to do you in, and they have to be trying to do you in in the same way. They have to be conspiring with each other before it fails to work. So it's a distributed consensus mechanism. Okay? And it's cryptographically provable that you know, it maintains this sort of thing. So what you can do is you can say, okay, the blockchain there has certain algorithms that have been publicly discussed and people decided it was okay. You send a message to that. We certify that you're okay. We check that out with some identity mechanism. That goes to your local telco. Then they send back an answer, which is recorded on the blockchain. So we know for all people to see that you asked this question of them, got this answer. Okay? So it's making the analysis of the data public, incorruptible in the sense that it's very hard to fake or hide what's going on. So it's auditable. And then the questions are things like, well, okay, can you do this with lots of types of data? And yes, you can do this with banking data and telco data and stuff, and there are plans to do this. You'll notice a little thing up here that says algorithm certification. Um, what does that look like? Well, that actually is something, in my view, that is the equivalent of the legislative process. Right? It's something where you have lots of people who are stakeholders saying, well, that looks like a safe one. You can ask that question. That one other one here doesn't look like a safe one. I don't see another way to do this, okay, <laughs> incidentally. You have to have all the different stakeholders looking at it. And they have to have tools for analyzing things. We have to become more sophisticated about this. There's lots of ways to screw up. What we've done to develop the initial set of things is we've run these series of things or help run them uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, in London, in Senegal, in Northern Italy, uh, where we've developed a toolkit. And this is a thesis work of Yves de Montjoy, who's going to be here at Imperial and part of the Turing uh, Institute. So if you want, you can talk to him. Um, and, a toolkit of things that look safe, and what we did to say, are they safe, is we, under a very strict legal contract, gave data answers, right? Not the raw data, the answers, to all these academic groups all over the world, and we said, do your thing on that, right? And, and they had said in the legal contract, that they would you know, look at the electric grid, look at disease spreading, look at different problems. So all these groups tried to do it. And, and one of the things many of the groups said they would do is they'd look at um, various things that are dangers, like re-identification, um, different sort of nightmares that you can imagine. And so we developed a set of things mostly based on aggregation, sufficient careful aggregation, where nobody was able to do bad things, but we were able to do lots of good things. So those look like questions that you can ask that are good questions. And in fact, you can do stuff that's pretty interesting. Like for instance, we've developed a method of asking, are these questions discriminatory? There's a nice little mathematical thing that takes the answers that you get, projects them on sensitive variables like gender, race, etc., and asks, do, are these answers biased in any way relative to these variables? It's not perfect, but it ain't bad. So the idea there, and this is what I'm calling it a social contract, is that if we can, as a community, I mean all the sort of stakeholders, develop ways of answering questions, 
that are useful for running our society, that sounds like a social contract to me, right? We're figuring out who is asking what questions to do what things. It involves both education of people, because the people have to sort of get together and learn what this does and decide that it's a good one or bad one and how to use it. it design, it's, it's a rulemaking thing in the sense that you come up with an algorithm that answers a specific question that people have said, yeah, that's, that's a good one. It's useful to us, it looks safe. Right? And uh, so it's like making laws and electing people. And maybe what we can do is we can begin building that infrastructure the same way that over the last many hundreds of years we've built the notions of legislatures and democracy and so forth um, to answer questions and govern our society. In the past, most of the, the regulatory mechanisms have been things that are built on this you know, rational individual model maybe what we can begin doing is building things based on this better model of the way people are. Um, so let me just end with one more thing, which is that it is possible to do something that you might not have believed. It is possible to do this model on fully encrypted data where the data is never decrypted. So we know from Snowden's papers that even the NSA has a very difficult time breaking encrypted data. The moment you decrypt it, they can get in there and get it. So you never want to decrypt it. But it turns out that there are methods of computing things, computing these answers directly off of the encrypted data. So you never have to decrypt them. What that means is, is that the data, the answers, the whole system um, becomes intrinsically extremely difficult to attack. It's hard to imagine the things that would attack. Maybe really successful quantum computing. If you bribed 60% of the people who are validators on the blockchain to do something, things like that. But things that are sort of crazy. Um, and that's a system we call Enigma. Uh, it has a great deal of interest because of the intrinsic uh, safety of it. These are some of the things people say about this visit, this vision, this system of Enigma. So, going to change the world. Holy shit. <laughs> Implications for healthcare are enormous. That's the head of the technical head of the human health and services in the US. And Laurie Lessig, who's a famous, he did Creative Commons, he's a famous lawyer at Harvard, says basically this makes it possible to use and maintain it without holding it. Does that sound like anything to anybody? That's the one that's really revolutionary. Because what that means is that I can compute things, say, against lots of banks' private databases to see if, in aggregate, they're doing things that are dangerous without them sharing their data legally. You can do it across jurisdictions. It just transforms a lot of the problems that you have um, about data sharing about ownership, about jurisdiction, um, by allowing you to answer approved questions despite the traditional way we think about things. And what it's doing, of course, is it's saying, look, I can ask questions about aggregates without endangering in any way, legally, practically, technically, individual ownership rights, individual privacy, national rights. It's just a very different way of thinking about things. So it, it takes a while to absorb, but um, it might be useful to think about it. Anyhow, there we are. Thank you. And I went too long, right? A little bit too long. Sorry. But thanks very much. We, we okay. have uh, only a few minutes for questions, but I think we'll, we'll take a bit more time and then we'll eat into our coffee break. So we'll extend the next session five or 10 minutes too. Um, maybe uh, I could be cheeky and ask the first question. Sure. Uh, which is, could you maybe expand a bit on uh, some of the worries you might have about 
what you're proposing here? What, 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 are, what are some of the concerns? How might, might yeah. this help so, people in any way? So what's really interesting in this sort of vision is, is that data does not want to be free anymore. Data is locked down. Right? You know exactly where it goes and who uses it for what. That's a really interesting thing. And even the bad guys and even the national security agents can't get at it. But you have to have questions and data that you share that are genuinely safe. And that's going to be a learning experience, um, right? Because there's all sorts of ways you can screw up. <laughs> okay, so we will screw up, guaranteed. But I think it's interesting that um, it's a really different sort of vision of the future um, where you can use data in a, in a very controlled way. And the proposal is, is, is that we build social institutions to approve algorithms and analyze algorithms the way we would do laws. You treat algorithms as laws and you monitor them that way too. Are they doing what you expected to do? And so we're building tools to do that. They will screw up in various ways, I'm sure. There are lots of things we don't understand in terms of dangers. What are the things that I really worry about? The one I really worry about is what happens if you have systems like this spreading around the world. Um, and so just imagine that you had something like this and all this data, and then you had a Syria, right? So could you go into this system and find all the X-type people and exterminate them? The nice thing about this is that the people can turn themselves off so that you can't find them anymore. Right? So people can opt out of the system. Of course, when you opt out, then you opt out of everything. Um, but trying to do something where you can't have an abusive authoritarian government is probably the biggest danger and the one that I don't think is really solved. And we have some solutions, um, but you know, <laughs> you can come up with nightmares. Yeah. Well, that, that does a lot. I think I, I personally like to follow up on that, but I'll now open uh, it to the floor. Let's take maybe two or three questions and then um, we'll come back. So I see Eduardo uh, here and then here. Um, uh, thank you for your talk, Professor Pendlin. Um, if you had more people plugged into providing data, you feel that this would, in fact, uh, continue to be consistent with the goals that you explain, I assume? Um, yeah, it's intended to be scalable. Um, some things get really difficult as you get lots more different types of data. Like you have to be very, you know, Things like re-identification become a first-rate problem pretty quickly. Right? So for instance, when you think about answers, you have to make sure that you can't ask a sequence of answers that undoes the anonymization. But we have some pretty good mathematical ways of answering that question now. We just have to have a system, and it's a human system, not a computer system, that um, asks about all the dangerous things in the right way, right? It's, you know, it's like engineering anything. You, you can make mistakes. And in this case, the mistakes give away people's privacy, other sort of sensitive data. Um, so you want to make sure you don't make those mistakes, but you also have to realize that in any human system, you're going to get some at least, like when people started building bridges, they used to fall down. And, and that was bad. People figured that out. And then they figured out how to make them so they don't fall down very often. And, and it, you have to look at it as it's going to be that sort of process, I mean, just realistically. Maybe we can take these two at a time. Yes, hi. Um, I was wondering if there part of the way it's been constructed is with a default of authentication. So is, is by signing up to this system of, of having your data accessible, um, it all being encrypted by default? And I ask that in terms of the, the, you know, the set of population that might be 
uh, the, the amount they may understand and, and it be communicated to them what they are um, getting involved with, such that under, you know, the, the uh, awareness, the education yeah. of people, and how that distribution may impact the use and availability of this system. And if uh, a natural disaster happens, the likelihood that that might not be the first thing that they can focus on under those circumstances, um, much less the education that, that is required to do that well. So uh, um, the proposal is that um, we change the basic properties of data. And that you make it so that you can only get at data if you have uh, the right permissions and the right identity, right, authenticated identity. Um, and I think that has enormous positive ramifications. You can still do stupid things with it, <laughs> right? That's for sure. Um, and as I said, like with the example of Syria, one of the things that is questionable is if data is locked down in this particular way, what happens in a disaster? Do you have the ability to get at it? Um, and who makes the decisions about what are the safe questions to answer? Right? Um, but those are the same sort of things that you have when you talk about making laws. Right? Um, I mean, one of the things that happened with the Ebola crisis was that the laws that those countries had enacted for protecting privacy, for good reasons, did not have, in some cases, an exception for emergencies. So the companies looked at it and said, I really, I'd love to. I think it's the right thing to do, but I can't. It's against the law. We'll get, after the fact, you'll come back and whack me, right? Um, and so they didn't design the algorithm right, is what happened, okay? Because they weren't thinking about that. Um, so I think it's the same type of thing. Now in terms of, the thing to, to recognize is that when you talk about designing algorithms, 50% um, of the problem is education. What you have to have is what I like to refer to as informed <laughs> consent. That means people have to actually understand. You could go to somebody on the street, not anybody famous, smart, anything like that. Do you understand it? And they have to be able to give you an answer that's basically correct, right, without thinking about it. If you have that level of education, then that's probably something that is a, a decent rule, right? Um, but it's hard to do that. Like in the United States, we have an informed consent thing for auto loans and loans of various sorts. That document's a one-page little document, but it took 50 years of battles and repeated trials to get there. And a lot of it was educating, you know, everybody in society about what it was you were signing and what the deal was. Not the, the lawyers knew 50 years ago, right? But nobody else did. So how do you get society, meaning everybody, to sort of understand it? That's sort of the education process. Right? So that's part of the stakeholder process. It's part of the legislative process. More so than it's been in the past. Yeah. Right, thank you. Um, so we're seeing rapid development in, in this research field. Um, I wonder what, what advice would you give to uh, people entering the field, I mean, younger researchers um, looking to establish themselves in, in this specific um, area, so theoretically, empirically, and maybe methodologically, what you know, what what advice would you give? How how should one train oneself to to catch up in, in, in this rapidly expanding field, also technically quite demanding? Um, well, I think there's um, on the social science side. I think that we're beginning to generate a very different picture of humanity than we traditionally have. A lot of our picture of ourselves comes from that bad, that six, you know, 17th century view of who we are. I think sort of getting beyond that to something that works better um, is a major field of study for the next long time. This notion of how do we redo the legislative process to include the education of people, how do we reach consensus within a society, um, is a major focus, I think. Because, you know, previously, it's a bunch of rich guys made laws, 
right? <laughs> you, know, you had to live with it. Um, we don't want to do that anymore. And so how do you come up with descriptions that everybody agrees and understands? And how do you, I mean, how do you reach that state? Um, there are parts of that that are really interesting, the intersections between technology and psychology, things like studies of collective intelligence, right, or collective belief, um, I think are really, really fascinating. Because that's a part of anything in this new future, is how do you get consensus and, and being informed among an entire population? We don't really know how to do that. Right? I see one more question. Are, are there any? Uh, we can maybe take one or two more if everyone promises to be really quick. One there. Is there anyone else? Okay. And maybe we're, we'll take these both at the same time so that we can wrap up. This is a really simple, easy one. Not. Um, I agree with you about the problem with rich guys making laws. How <laughs> do we, in, in your inventor's new social contract, how do we move beyond? rich, white, elite, technologically connected people making laws? My question is quite different then. So uh, I'm based in the medical science campus here. So we've got a study a bit like the Framingham study, except there's a 500,000 people who are obviously are following up for a long time. Um, and obviously these mobile signals are very interesting. We'd just like to get, uh, I guess, some of your uh, war stories then of trying to uh, uh, I guess link data at the individual level because aggregate is no good for us. Yeah, so just to do it in reverse. So, you know, human subject law, medical law is, is actually um, not so bad there. The problem, of course, is informed consent, uh, really having people understand it. Um, so I'm not, you know, there are methods of doing individual level data like we just launched a study of 10, 000, a longitudinal study of 10,000 people in New York where we're looking at their biological everything plus their behavior to sort of look at the relationship between behavior and, and you know, your biome and things like that. Um, and at least so far it looks like people understand what they're happening and they're willing to buy into it and do it and I think it'll be a transformative study. In terms of actually how, to, how do you get it to be more of a <laughs> distributed process. Uh, uh, short answer, I don't know. Longer answer um, is I'm a big believer in uh, trying things. I think you can find communities that are willing to volunteer to try out a new way of living. And, um, you know, with their eyes open, like it's like the medical study, right? And, uh, and see how it feels. And some of those will work and some of them won't work. You have to be careful you don't kill everybody um, or, or hurt the children or something like that. But um, I think that these things are complicated enough that we can't sit in our offices and understand them. I think we have to have what I call living labs, which is people wanting to try and live in a new way and then reflecting on it. What actually happened? How did it feel? Is this something we want? And in terms of propagating experiences like that, I think that you need to have um, actual physical interaction between people. You have to get together and talk about it. You can't just post it on the web somewhere. So I think one of the big problems that we're seeing in our societies today is we've become very segregated physically, mostly by wealth. You see these, you know, banlus and favelas and things like that. The rich people and the poor people don't talk anymore. Of course they have different views of the world, right? They don't, one group doesn't experience the life of the other one. How can they come to any sort of consent? So I'm a big believer in physical mixing of things. Um, but remember the short answer that I don't know, right? Okay, well, th thanks again. Sure.